to us Step up to the other one. There you go. There you go. Unnecessary, but it's all right. All right, you're good. You know what you're doing? Yeah. Right there. Yeah, sure. Uh, a supply pastor, Pastor Carolyn Mann, will lead worship and celebrate communion with us two Sundays a month starting September 17th. She will also be here September 24th, October 8th, and 22nd. Von Pooster, council president, will also be, was also able to reserve an LA, ELCA. ELCA deacon to cover worship for the rest of the Sundays in September and October. We will continue to coordinate pastor coverage for worship the following months, and a new info will be shared when available. Start planning. St. John Welka will again be collecting items for school, personal care, and fabric kits for Lutheran word relief. School supplies are now on sale. The lists are printed and laying in the welcome table in the narthex. Upcoming events, St. John's Book Club. Information for August meetings are in the bulletin. I love that, that was a Carry a meal for Pastor Jeff and his family is Sunday, August 27th, immediately after following worship. Bring a few dishes of your favorite food to share and enjoy with the fellowship to bid farewell to Pastor Jeff. Blessing of the Hunters will take place during the worship service on September 3rd. Just, that, um, just continue to help. Okay. So continue to help the collecting items for the homeless in the food, food pantry. Everything, see, everything else you can find in the announcements. Everything else is, you can find in the announcements. All right, good job. You did it. Yeah. Are you doing the reading too? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna leave the one box close. Perfect. I don't need the box. We were Elaine, I got a couple talk. It's all right. If you would have been on that box, you would have seen it. Nope, wouldn't have worked. <laughs> See? We have had the opportunity to get faith leaderships for the month of September and October. Um, uh, Deacon Nancy Mann will be here, as Dom said, the first Sunday in September and the first, third, and fifth Sundays in October. She will not be able to do the communion those Sundays but Pastor Carolyn Mann will be doing the communion on the third and fourth Sundays in September and the second and fourth Sundays in October. So please plan on those. Uh, when I was emailing with Pastor Mann, she is only willing to do two Sundays a month because she is retired. Um, she also has said she will be available in November and December, which we will be discussing dates uh, on Tuesday evening at council. Uh, to see what dates we would like to have her in. And she's taking January off, that's what she said. I have had contact with another pastor from Orville who can probably help us out maybe that month. So uh, be aware that there will be more information coming. The one thing that kind of got slipped through was we don't have exact 
uh, plans and the work yet for God's work our hands. Uh, nothing defined yet. That is going to be uh, addressed this week, and there will be information uh, next Sunday for you after we discuss this at council. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Great to see you here this morning. Uh, any visitors we have with us, we are grateful that you are here. And if you are worshiping with us online, uh, we are thankful that you are with us to worship and praise our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. 
I invite the congregation to stand for our invocation and our brief order for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned. We have hurt our community. We have squandered your blessings. We have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Sorry, God is. You can, yeah, you can. God is. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is hymn number 725 in the blue hymnal. The blue hymnal, 725. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. with you and also with you let us pray god of all peoples 
Your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Congregation may be seated for the first two lessons. If you need anything, just let me know, okay? The first lesson is from wait. The first Yep. The first lesson is from the 56th chapter of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, may maintain justice and do what is right. For soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast by covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. And wait up, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, he gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. The word of the, the, word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second lesson, Romans chapter 11, verse 1 through 2, and verses 29 through 32. Nice. I ask, then God, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once a disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now to be disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite the congregation to stand for proclamation of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of a mouth that defiles Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth and enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and that is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defiles a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. 
Jesus left that place and went to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation may be seated. I invite children forward. How are y'all doing? Good. Good. Fantastic. All right. So, in our gospel lesson today, we hear about the most powerful thing, I think in God's opinion, the most powerful thing, definitely in my opinion, most powerful thing in the entire, in all of creation, the entire universe. Do you know what that thing is that we hear about? What do you think is the most powerful thing in all of creation? Take a moment, think about it. I realize I just, yeah, Della? Jesus, yes. That's always a right answer in a children's sermon. Jesus is always a right answer. So yes, he is, and I think the right answer goes with that. But there's, what else? What are some other things you think might be other than Jesus? God, yes. And so we got the Holy Trinity there, yep. Somebody here, um, Elise, will you say, raise your hand, Elise? Say Holy Spirit. Yeah, so we have the Trinity, yeah. We have God, Father, Holy Spirit. Uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What else? Now that we have God taken care of, what is the next most powerful thing? And I think what you said is right, because life, yeah, it's pretty powerful. Love, why is it always you? Why is it always you? Yes. At least you want to give your answer to? Food and water, water, yes. And then Dom? Love. Do you you guys agree with Dom that love's the most powerful thing? Why? Because nothing can break it. True love, yes, I would say nothing can break true love. So in the gospel story, here's what happens. There's like two different stories in the gospel story. And in my sermon, um, I don't know if anybody out there realized it, I had picked just the second story because I was given that option. And then I forgot that I picked the second one and I was doing my sermon this week. I actually chose the first story. And so I had to bring up a Bible and read the whole thing. But so in the second story, we have a woman who has a daughter And the daughter has a demon, so she's not doing well, to say the least. She's not doing well. She has a demon. And this woman shows up to ask Jesus for help. The problem is Jesus was um, from a certain country, a certain group of people. Does anyone know what group of people he was from? Starts with an I. Israelite. Israelite. Yeah, so he's from Israel. He was an Israelite. And this woman was not an Israelite. She was a Canaanite. And if you go back further in the Bible, the Israelites and the Canaanites do not typically get along with each other. And so this woman comes because her daughter has a demon. So why does she want her daughter healed? She what? She loves her daughter. And so she goes to Jesus, and Jesus says, Sorry, can't help you. Can't help you. Does that sound like Jesus? No, it doesn't sound like Jesus. Yeah, he's just like, like, I'm not even going to talk to her. And she's like, no, I really, really need your help for my daughter. You're the only person who can help. And even though Jesus doesn't answer at first. And then when she continues on, and Jesus calls her a what? Not a Canaanite. Sounds somewhat similar. What? No. 
he, he, she's like something else. He's like, he compares her to something. He says, you're like a dog. And the people don't give their food to dogs. I'm not going to share my, mate, how many of you share your food with dogs at home? Yeah, all right. So <laughs> some of us do. Some of us do, but he's like, you know, we don't do that. And so she was, did you think that made her feel good about herself? No, she probably might even want to to leave. But she wasn't going to leave until she got what she needed from Jesus. Why? Because she loved her daughter. daughter. And so she didn't even care what Jesus called her. You can call me whatever you want. In fact, she says, you can call me a dog, but it's true, dogs even get scraps. Or the crumbs that fall from the table. Which is true. Or sometimes vegetables that kids don't want to eat and put under the table. Okay? So, she loves her daughter so much. And here's what you guys need to know about about your family, your parents, your grandparents, the people that love you. Love is so powerful that if it came down to it, if it came down to you getting hurt or your parents getting hurt or your grandparents getting hurt or the people that care for you getting hurt, do you know what your parents, your grandparents, the people that care for you know what they would do? They would choose to get hurt for you. They would say, nope, don't let Owen get hurt. Don't let Reese get hurt. Maybe Georgia, but don't let (laughs) Rowan get hurt. You're in the seventh grade, so I know that side eye is just a permanent fixture. (laughs) Yeah, I know. So... They love you so much that they would put themselves in harm's way. And this mom in the story puts herself, she doesn't care what happens, she just needs Jesus' help. And Jesus sees that, and he goes, that's it. Because the most powerful thing is love, and that's what it's all about. And your faith, your faith, her faith in Jesus, that he is the one who can heal her daughter, that's so powerful because of that love, that Jesus says, you know what? Your daughter's fine. And right away, was the woman even with the daughter, does it say? No, just right away, boom, the daughter was healed. So, the most powerful thing in the universe isn't money. Um, It's not how big your house is. It's not how many friends you have. It's not, you know, anything else. The most powerful thing in the world is love. And that's why your answers were right, because do you know what God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you know what they are? They are love, all right? Would, I know I insulted you earlier. Would you be willing to still say a prayer with me? Yeah? Okay, thank you. That's called mercy. All right. Please repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God we, thank you we thank you for giving us people, people in our lives, lives who love us so much, us so much that they would do anything to make sure that we were healthy and cared for and loved. We love you. Amen. All right. Solid work. I didn't pick on you once that entire children's sermon, so be ready next week. I got a whole bunch to fit into one week next week. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So how many of you know what a, we might have one here. I, just, I think I might even ask about, how many know what a processional cross is? Raise your hand if you know what a processional cross is. Or don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand if you don't know what a processional cross is. I just want to see hands go in the air. Raise your hand if you hear the words coming out of my mouth right now. All right, thank you. Processional cross is, is a little, I mean, it depends the size of the cross, can be different, but it's on a pole, and it's, it's carried up, processing into the church for a service and carried out of the church at the end of the service, kind of like the acolyte does with the... Uh, with a taper, with a lighter, and then taking the, the lit flame out. 
So that's what a processional cross is. Some churches use them every week. Some use them on special occasions. Uh, some, you know, maybe used to use them and they just got out of the habits. And when you're already having a hard time finding acolytes to find an additional person on top of that to carry a cross gets kind of uh, difficult. But now that we're on the same page, we know what a, uh, a processional cross is. Uh, so the first church I served, they had a processional cross, and they used it every week. And the way their system was, was when you were in confirmation, you could be an acolyte. You couldn't be an acolyte until you were in confirmation, and then you couldn't be a, a crucifer, somebody who carries the processional cross. You couldn't be a crucifer until you were confirmed. And you had to wear little white gloves. Um, I did not when I got yelled at for not wearing the white gloves and touching the, uh, the brass. But you had to wear white gloves, and there was, there was this whole process for it. Well, at the church when I first got there, I think kind of like this altar, the, uh, the altar was up against the wall under a shelf like that. Right. So this is going to make sense, yeah. Back in the good old days. It used to be up there. Yeah, so it was up there. And I said, okay, you're, you know, your altar's up here. And we would talk, um, come up at worship and music or different things. And, and they would brag. They would brag about how they, when they redid their, their church, how they made the altar be on sliders in the shelf, like this one was fixed to the wall. And so the altar could go under the shelf but it could also be taken out if that ever needed to happen and, and that somebody ever wanted to pull it out. And so I was there for about four or five months and I said, you know, let's pull the altar out. And at first they were like, well, why would we do that? And I said, well, you bragged about how there's things in the bottom of it to pull it out. Let's pull it out. It's more relational. I can get behind it. I can look at you while I'm also uh, looking at the altar and so they said, okay, so we moved it out, and there was probably some murmurs about that. We moved it out, but here was the issue. Probably like with this, when we moved the altar out, then everything else that had its place up there had to be readjusted. Because then candles and where flowers went, and the processional cross had a holder, a base in the holder was up against the wall by the altar. And so after we moved the altar out, I said, well, we can't leave the, we're not going to keep putting the cross up there because that's, it's too far back. It's supposed to go closer to the altar or closer to the front. So they said, what do we do? And I said, okay, um, so let's move it. So I moved the processional cross. It seemed like a good place. I put it right by the lectern. It was flipped. The, alt, the uh, pulpit was on that side. The lectern was on this side. Not that it matters. If any pastor ever tells you that it matters which side the pulpit's on, um, immediately call the bishop and ask for a new pastor. So, um, so I put it, I moved it, I made an executive decision, I put the processional cross right next to the lectern. And that lasted for a week. And somebody came up and they said, and it was never the person who made the statement, it was somebody else said, well, somebody was talking to me and they said, we can't put the processional cross by the lectern because the gospel's read from the pulpit. And the processional cross needs to be close to the pulpit because that's where the gospel is read. The cross, the gospel. And I said, I'm familiar with these things. And they said, yes, yeah, so it has to be moved. And I said, okay. And so I moved the processional cross over next to the pulpit. And that lasted for a week. A person came to me and said, Pastor, um, there's a problem with where the processional cross is. And I said, well, it's, you know, it's by the, the pulpit, you know, the gospel. I was told all of that. And, and they said, yes, but the problem is so-and-so, because of where they sit, they can't see you now because the processional cross is on an angle, it was over here, and they can't see you from their seat. Now they had pews, just like you. And I said, could the person move down? About a foot, one direction or the other? Well, pastor, they've sat in that seat 
for 40 years, that's where they sit. I said, well, did they really have to see me? And they said, yes, they have to be able to see you. They're doing, they were doing many things, Carla. I don't know if reading lips was one. <laughs> Testing my patience, that was one thing. And so I said, okay, where are we going to move it? And so I thought, well, we'll move it back closer, pulpit side, but closer to the altar because then it's close to the gospel, but it's also close to the altar where communion is, and that's where it used to be, and we'll just do that. And that lasted one week. I'm glad you're catching on to the pattern. And they said, Pastor, it doesn't work because it kind of gets uh, in the way of like the acolytes are going to like, when they're getting stuff, it just, it's not in the way. And I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. So then the next week they showed up and I had the processional cross right in front of the cha- chancel steps. So, and I sat in every pew in that room to make sure you could see it wherever you were and that it wasn't blocking the, you know, it was down enough and wasn't blocking, blocking the sight line of, of anybody who was speaking and it was right there. And do you think they liked that? No, they didn't like it. But did I know they weren't going to like it? Yes, I knew they weren't going to like it and I still put it there anyway for this reason. I asked them, during the message that week, I said, how many people like where the processional cross is? And like you guys, nobody raised their hand at the beginning of the message. And I said, okay. I said, what is this thing called that's up here? Somebody raised their hand, and they said, the processional cross. And I said, correct. I said, you know what a processional cross is used for? And they said, somebody else raised their hand, they said, to process into the worship service and to process out of the worship service and i said that's correct i said you know what happens when we put that processional cross in its stand and they said what and i said it stops processing it has served its purpose it's now just a thing that is there And when it needs to be used, it'll be used again. But while it's not being used, it doesn't matter where it goes. Someone actually, this was was amazing. Somebody actually raised their hand. Actually, I don't think, I think they just shouted out. And they said, but we like to be able to, to see it. It was a beautiful processional cross. And I said, why do you like to see it? And they said, because we like to be able to see the cross, you know. And that makes sense. But here's what they were failing to recognize. Behind the altar, in stained glass, was a huge cross. About ten times the size of the processional cross. You know what was on the side of every pew? You know what many of them were wearing around their neck? A cross. Where did it end up? Um, I think it ended up back by the pulpit by me. And I just told the person, I said, if you want to see me, you have to move. Um, That's what you're going to have to do. And I think they left the church. Um, I think they didn't come. I'm kidding. I think they stayed, but they just weren't happy. They probably moved. Does it matter where a processional cross is? I mean, is it nice to be able to see it? Yeah, it's nice. I think somebody had donated it, and like, so it was a memorial to somebody, you know, and it was, was not nice to like act, treat it like it wasn't important because it was important, and it served a very uh, a good purpose in the service. It, it gave a focal point in reminding us the service starts off um, and that we're led by the cross, you know, into worship and, and out of worship. And those are good things. I wouldn't ever say get rid of a processional cross. But in our lives, not just in church, and most of my examples, as you've probably noticed, most of my examples come from church because that's just where I spend most of my time. But so often in life, 
we focus on these little things, these little details that do not matter. They matter to some people, but raise your hand if you can name one person who did not care where that processional cross was. Other than me. <laughs> Pretend it's a children's sermon. Jesus. Jesus didn't care where that processional cross was. Jesus, I'm assuming, could not stand the fact that somebody was sitting in the pews and was so worked up about where the processional cross was that they didn't hear anything else that was going on in the service. In the gospel story, this is an important thing. So we don't have any food restrictions. You know, in Acts, you know, God tells Peter, eat, you know, it doesn't matter, just eat whatever. That's, it's not, uh, those no, things are no longer off limits to you. And so as Christians, especially nowadays, we, we don't have any dietary restrictions that tie to our faith. And so to us, in a way, it seems kind of odd or trivial when we read the story and it says, you know, well, what goes in your mouth doesn't defile you. And, you know, we're like, well, yeah, we know that. It's pretty obvious. But we have to remember that when Jesus says this for a thousand years... These people have not been eating specific food for one reason. And that reason was because God said, don't eat these foods. And now you have this guy saying, you know what? It really doesn't matter whether their hands were washed or really what they even ate. That's not a big deal. And here's what I think gets lost sometimes as we go over it. One, it was a big deal. Because God had told them, don't do these things. And so it was a big deal to be breaking away from that. But I think this is what Jesus is saying, and I think this is what the gospel message is in this story. It's not so much that, that they shouldn't wash their hands before they eat. They should. It's not so much that they should have avoided, at least at that time, certain foods. You know, they probably should. But when it comes down to it, when it comes down to washing your hands or being a jerk by what you say and do, which one's more important to do? Don't be a jerk by the things you say and the things you do. It's important to wash your hands. It's important to listen to what God tells us to do and to follow God's commands. But we have to remember that even though our sins are not ranked uh, and there's not a hierarchy necessarily of sins, that when it comes to what God tells us to do, there is a hierarchy. And the first thing that God tells us to do, the main thing that God tells us to do is to love. And so it doesn't matter. You can be following all of these other laws and commandments that God has given, all these things about what to eat, what not to eat, about where to take a processional cross and, and place it. We can follow all of those little things. But when it all comes down to is if we are not acting and treating one another as Jesus wants us to treat one another, then it doesn't matter where you put a processional cross. When there are people in your community that don't have food, that don't have clothing, when there are people that don't know about Jesus' love and you're worried about something tiny in your church, then you are worrying about the wrong thing. And sometimes, and Jesus was a master at this, sometimes you have to say something shocking to get people's attention. I've said it before, and I'll say it uh, forever. This church is different in a good way. But it would be foolish of me to think that in the past or in the future, there haven't been or there won't be times when people get focused on something that maybe they shouldn't focus on. And when that happens, we need to be kind with one another because we all fall into those traps. Because even though you might not care about a processional cross, you might care about where an altar is. Or you might care about how an acolyte lights the candles. 
So we should be kind. But at the same time, we need to be kind and loving enough to be able to to turn all of our attention, to turn our fellow members' attention back to what really matters. We need to remember that being unclean and being defiled, those aren't great things, but we're going to be that way because we are sinners. We need to remember that what's worse is the things that come out of our mouths and our actions or our, our failure to act at times. And then we need to be thankful that even when we are unclean, even when we sin, that we are not left on our own. That the one who instructs us, the one who commands us, is also the one who loves us so much that he died for us. Everything else comes in a distant second. We focus on the cross and the resurrection, not on a processional cross, but on a cross that Jesus died on almost 2,000 years ago. And by that love and that forgiveness, let it guide us in how we interact with one another and how we approach the world with our ministry. Amen. I invite the congregation to stand. Is it Green Book? Uh, in our green hymnal, hymn number 479, 479.
Let us confess our Christian faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. O oh God, your spirit gathers the church. Shepherd those who are newly baptized and newly ordained in the proclamation of the gospel. Breathe life into ecumenical and support missionaries throughout the globe. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You created the earth and all its inhabitants and declared it good. Clean, polluted skies, seas, and soil. Provide nourishment to plants and animals and make us aware of our impact on the environment. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You call leaders to bridge differences and practice generosity. Inspire all in authority to protect people in harm's way. Deliver those in bondage, support fair elections. Provide care for military personnel and veterans. And show mercy to those for whom they have responsibility. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You provide for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Embrace people who have been rejected because of difference. Heal trauma caused by racism or prejudice. Shield any who are persecuted. Console the dying and heal the sick, especially those who we now name either aloud or silently in our hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. O God, you journey with us in all of life's transitions. Guide those preparing for baptism, marriage, and retirement. Guide our church council and committees in their visioning and ministry. Safeguard those who travel. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We give you thanks for those who now rest from their labors. Motivate us by their lives of dedication to the gospel. Until that day when we join with them in our eternal home. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share that peace with one another. Point at each other, and they're both in trouble. And, yeah, it'd be funny, but I don't know if it's worth it. People are all clogged up in the aisle, can't get through.
Let us pray. Merciful Father, God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so at the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. Congregation may be seated.
invite the congregation to stand. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. And let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world. Through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now until the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn is in the blue book, I believe. I did not put the number in the bulletin. 756. 756. 756.
Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.